my head will look a lot better than I do. I think, uh, I don't know why, whenever I catch sight of myself off in the mirror sometimes, I think, uh, uh, who's that? What's going on? <laughs> Where have I gone? Mm. <laughs> mm. Particularly, if I may say, once you get near the age of uh, 60, which you're very yeah. far from. Um, I'm not, actually. I am exactly 60. Yeah, which which direction did you think I was far from? I thought you were un- <laughs> north or south. Well, you you look. If I were to guess, I'd say you you were fifty. To be honest with you. Yeah, there is a painting of me up in the attic that's looking really really <laughs> knackered now. Well, uh, bring it down, Steve, because uh, the you know the truth of that needs to be confirmed. <laughs> a very young looking chap. And uh, now you were telling me, you were telling me the other day where the purpose of this really is to reflect on theatre and our theatre experiences as much as anything else. Um, And you were telling me uh, a while ago where we first met. Of course, we know each other through theatre, not through anything else. Um, But uh, now, do you remember where it was? Yes, it was was Amadeus and uh, I really annoyed you. Oh, God, I annoyed you so much. I've got some explanation for that now as well, uh, in that um, my son, Oscar, um, was exhibiting one or two of the symptoms of which might be ADHD, might be sort of autism. So I did a lot of research into it. Turns out um, he, if he is uh, affected, is borderline uh, hardly at all. But I... I'm actually sort of out there somewhere. I'm definitely on the spectrum. Now, I haven't had a proper diagnosis for anything, but um, it kind of accounts for so many things, like my inability to stop laughing. Because if, if you remember, you were Salieri. Mm. We were rehearsing it in some rehearsal room somewhere, and mm. you, were, you, were, you were doing this wonderful speech about mm. um, Mozart's music and how you could hear it. And mm. just so happened, in the room next door, some umpa music started off. Yes. When, and rather than typical of you, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't stop. You just kept on going, and it got funnier and funnier as it went on. And of course, normal people, so typical type people, can they can control that kind of reaction. Yes. And I did for a while, but I just lost it, and I just c- collapsed into some kind of fits of giggles. I couldn't stop. It was one of the funniest things I've ever experienced. And of course, um, you were really annoyed with me because, you know, you were taking it seriously, which is your thing. Yes. You, you, you take theatre deadly serious all, yes. all the way, which is one of your strengths. But in this case, it kind of collided with my weakness and <laughs> it was just like a horrible situation. So um, I, I annoyed you fantastically. I remember having to phone you up and apologise. Oh, God. Yeah, that's how we met. <laughs> I do remember that now. I do. Yeah, I'm sure that. you do. Yeah, and I do remember the speech, which, uh, if pushed, I could do a game. <laughs> that is impressive. It, at a, well, you brought it back to me now because uh, it was a speech. It was a speech about the th- about the composition Mozart's composition of the thirteen st- serenade for thirteen string instruments. That's what it was. And he says something about he, he describes the music in the most beautiful terms, and then he says something about. And suddenly, high above, an oboe, like, a, and there's some description I wouldn't be able to do justice to because I can't quite remember it, but that's the speech. No, I thought we met earlier than that. Uh, well, we definitely met during um, during that play because I just returned from the Republic of Ireland where I've been living for a while because I, I, I lived in Stratford and was involved in Second Thoughts and then I went to Ireland for five six six and a half years and then came back and uh that was the first play that i did when i got back i hadn't been back very long oh i must be getting my dates mixed up then because i thought that you and i met first in uh, uh great expectations which i think was after that you were horlick horlicks yes i was and uh i play uh, yes a, a character who is very easily able to send an audience to sleep which <laughs> a technique well, maybe I've... that was before because I did sort of pop back at various times things. I came back for the Golden Pathway annual, um, uh, a trip yes. to Edinburgh and things like that. So sensational. It's it's the past. It's it's a very confusing time. It's another country, as they say. 
Um, L.P. Hartley said that, yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, well, it, yes, yes. But my, my difficulties with self-control is kind of explained if I am on the spectrum, because uh, all my life I've been learning coping strategies like not speaking too quickly, oh. like trying to tone down my enthusiasm, which I'm unable to do for auditions. For instance, I've been to like four auditions at Loft now, and I, mm. I know each time I go, I'm really sort of, this is a great play. I'm really, because I only go for stuff I really want to do. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Like, this is really good. I really want to do this. this is really, and I, even as I'm doing it, I'm thinking to myself, hang on, you're, these people don't know you. <laughs> Tone it down a bit. But by then, it's usually too late and, you know, <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting because you are famous for your laughter. You're famous for a lot of things, Steve, and we will come on to them. But you are famous for your... Uh, every show I've been in, people say, uh, this is the bit Steve will laugh at when we're rehearsing it. This is the bit Steve will... And that's very... I've never heard you describe it in that way. And it's because it's a sort of ADHD thing, is it? I think so. I think I tend to laugh at things that other people don't laugh at. Mm. I laugh a lot when things go wrong. Because uh, I love that kind of thing when they don't, mm. you know, when it's not deliberate and they go mm. wrong. Mm. Um, mm. But sometimes I'll, I'll I'll just pick up on something that will amuse me, but tends not to amuse other people. There's one classic. I mean, with this, it's a cultural thing. But I went to the Cork Film Festival, um, and they were doing um, a wonderful. It's not. It's not. It's a wonderful life. Uh, life is beautiful. The, the Mike Lee film. It just come okay, out. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. About mm -hmm. early nineties. Mm. And uh, there's a bit where George Broadbent, not George Broadbent, I've forgotten his name. Broadbent. Anyways, it's definitely his surname. I know. Uh, I know who you mean. Yeah, yeah. He, Harry Potter. He's, and, he's, mm. Yeah, he's drunk. Oh, he has been drunk the night before. And in the morning, he sort of sits up. And uh, Jim, it's called, Jim Broadbent. Jim Broadbent, well done. Mm, well, mm, I'll, st mm. I'll start that bit again, you can cut it out. Mm. There's, this, there's this part where Jim Broadbent um, uh, has been drunk the night before and it's in the morning afterwards and he's in bed with Alison Steadman and he's, he's playing his wife and he sort of sits up and he looks really sort of knackered and shattered and he says, oh God, I feel just like Princess Margaret. And it was, it was horrible in that sense because of course, it was, the cinema was full of Irish people, most of whom may have only had a vague idea who Princess Margaret was and have, would have no idea about her reputation as a party girl or the hard drinker or any of that sort of thing. Whereas, um, and it was so unexpected, it caught me by surprise. I couldn't stop laughing. I had to leave the cinema. It was terrible. That kind of thing. I just, uh, I have real trouble with self-control. That's very interesting, actually. But when any, interesting. wherever you, um, anyone's recording anything, like I have a lot of conversations at work with people, and uh, and they say this, 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 you know, you're doing a contract or something. This is being recorded, or even now, I feel it now. I want to start swearing, or oh. sort of shouting out sort of nonsense words. It's uh, it's terrible. Almost, really. almost a Tourette's thing, almost. Yeah. It's a subversion. I think I want to subvert everything around me. Oh. I had the same problem during the Brexit debate. Because the other problem is I tend to be able to see multiple sides of arguments. So during the Brexit debate, I kind of oscillated wildly between two positions. I would be sometimes wildly in favour of, of leave and then other times wildly in favour of remain. And mm -hmm. in the end, I went and spoiled my ballot paper and just wrote, I don't know. So yeah. I had to sort of register some kind of opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you genuinely didn't know. It wasn't an act of... No, no, it wasn't an act of subversion. I genuinely, I could see good arguments on both sides and still can, actually. People don't like that. People like it if you come down firmly on one side or the other. Yes. Well, that is one of the stupidities of a referendum, isn't it? You know, it takes an extraordinarily nuanced and labyrinthine uh, process and uh, turns it into a in-out, yes-no, that kind of thing. Yeah, it simplifies it to a ridiculous level. You I would were... be quite happy happy with a kind of Norway slash Switzerland kind of situation, I think. That would have made me happy. So we would have sort of left the political union and um, perhaps had nothing to do with the parliament or anything like that, but, but remained in the single market, possibly in the customs union. 
Yes, I would have only been happy if uh, our House of Commons had been abolished and we had been uh, uh, subsumed into uh, the European project <laughs> whole well, stale. You anyway, are let's not European. get on to that. Hey, what? <laughs> you hmm? are a European in the real sense, aren't you? You're well, dual, I, dual national. I am. Well, I am dual national, uh, but I'm I'm half Irish and half uh, Polish. I, I'm happy to say I have not a drop of English blood in my body. <laughs> Whereas I had my DNA done not that long ago. Did you? And I, I, mean, I, I think you're Irish. Are you Irish? I think you are. I'm not, no. Are you not? I'm oh, not. Right. I am English to a mad extent. Are there's, you? There's, there's a little bit of Dane and a little bit of Welsh, and it's something like 78% English, which is like really high for because we know how what a mongrel race yes. we are. Heavens. That is very, that's genuinely very interesting and runs completely counter to... Uh, well, I don't believe in national, you know, characteristics as such. Um, there are cultural characteristics which come down mm. to us, I, 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 in my humble opinion. What do I know? Nothing. But, of course, there is a very uh, long tradition in England of um, uh, subversive uh, rebellion and subversive, subversive uh, well, revolution, actually, <laughs> isn't there? And I think I would connect you with that cultural inheritance. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Give, give me an authority figure and I'll attempt to undermine it. <laughs> yes, that's true. From God to uh, uh, to uh, a postman who's a postman, I suppose. I don't know. I don't, I've no idea about your relationship with postman. I've no idea. But but uh, but certain. Yeah, that is true of you, isn't it? Uh, do, do you certainly, think that's true? God, yeah. Yeah. I remember telling, I won't name them because we both know them, but there was one particular religious person that um, I... I really did upset quite badly by insisting that she was my oppressor and what I meant was because uh, I think of myself as kind of working class working class old English stock rural mm. um, that the religious establishment have been oppressing people like me in the past mm. Mm. for mm. generations and generations making mm. us toe the line and be obedient mm. and mm. Promise, promising us rewards in heaven Yes. If we just if we just do what we're told. Yes. 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 Hate yes. that. Yes. Believe what we uh, do what we're told and believe what you're told to believe. Uh, yeah. Really is the, uh, yes. No, I think that's yeah. Uh, and and uh, yes. Now I ought to say you you very courteous there about not naming somebody, and I'm ever so glad you have not named somebody. But how flattering of you to think that anybody's going to listen to this. Uh, uh, to, <laughs> Well, I listen to some of them. Um, it depends yes. on who it is. But I've, I've, even before you invited me to be, to appear, I listened to quite a few. Oh, well, that's nice. quite a few. They're very important to me, these. Are. They're very important to me. They are, uh, I was saying this the other day to somebody, they're, they're like hand, you know, one of the most moving things I've seen, forgive me for giving my own views, but it's supposed to be a chat, as it were. So uh, mm. I, I don't feel too bad about butting this in. But uh, one of the most moving things I... Uh, have come across in recent years has been um, this uh, these photographs of the handprints on the caves of uh, mm. early humans, um, and this is one that's forty thousand years old that is for some reason really sticking in my brain. Uh, I think it's in Indonesia, and it's a red hand, or rather the outline of a red of a hand, and the assumption is that that, that whoever it is has blown a die of some sort onto the onto the, past that but there it is it's his hand on the wall as if to say i you know i was here in the kind of tree carving mm. sense but is it a deep human need you know I, and that's kind of what these are really it's it's we were we were here and the, the lovely thing it, there are not many advantages to this over theater not many but there is a permanence about this, the longevity about it, which which I like. I'm not saying theatre doesn't have that because it does in the memory, actually. So anyway, yes. So do you think that this um, uh, this um, uh, non-conformist approach to society and to hierarchy did it, did that does that feed into your theatrical? Uh, interests and the plays you like to direct and plays you like to be in the parts you like to play yeah i mean back in the day i would just do whatever 
people told me to do. Usually what Ian McLean told me to do, I would just sort of do that. And um, gradually I realised that was making me happy, not not because it was Ian McLean, but because, you know, uh, I needed to be more selective. So um, luckily, actually, uh, David Mears came along. See, I saw myself very much as some kind of uh, revolutionary figure, but if you want to go back to religious terms, or, I, or even in political terms, I was more sort of Trotsky. You know, I couldn't quite sort of make it work properly, or I was John the Baptist. You know, I was there, but there was, a, mm. there was somebody coming after me. And David mm. Mears is Lenin, or Jesus. Oh, oh my goodness. So I could, I could kind of hitch, attach my, my star to it, because I, I mean, I don't know, he's probably not got ADHD or something but there is, there's a certain sort of attention to detail in his work that kind of dovetails with what I want to do well you've been directed by me you can probably tell people better than I can even but um, the, the little things matter and they go to make a whole and even in plays that David's done that I don't like I can still see that attention to detail that makes the, the whole better and that's what all, all I was ever looking for. And the, the kind of amateur theatre, well, it's good enough, that'll do, used to really wind me up. And uh, so I just don't do that anymore. That's very true. <laughs> and incidentally, you've just stumbled across the, uh, the title for this podcast that must now be uh, David Mears is Lenin or Jesus. Yes, yes, it should be. Because he is. I'm a I'm a real fan. Who who is? And I'm not saying anything I haven't said to his face either. No, well, say it say it to the nation. <laughs> well, to the whole world. Whole well, you know as well as I do that this. What's astonishing about this pr process, and you we're both of the same generation, but um, you know the the, pro the, the I am still bedazzled by the fact that this once it's out there on the net. And I'd like to do one of these live actually one day. I think we, that would give a kind of free on to it, but um. Once it's out there in the interweb, in the world wide wait, it it goes out as far as the as far as signals can reach into the solar system. I mean, that's just frankly <laughs> astonishing. I think you'll never done. I'm an old man, and pencils astonish me. <laughs> well, as I often say, we're all living in the future. That's how it yes. feels, anyway. Yes, it is. Yes, particularly when we got to 2020, because that did have a kind of space age ring to it 2020 well, that, that's that's interesting because you're saying 2020 aren't you john golby would have hated that john golby was was he was so to, uh, he said after after 2009 it'll stop he says it'll be 2010 2011 2012 2020 but it hasn't for some weird reason but if you think about the last century you never said 1969 did you so why are we always saying 2000, Dan? It's just mad. Yeah, it really is. Yes, it is mad. But, and I uh, thought what 2012 would do it because it was definitely the 2012 Olympics. But then yeah, it seemed to come back to 2013 for some weird reason. And ironically, 2020 being the year of both, uh, you know, uh, Boris Johnson, COVID and Brexit... <laughs> Very much not the, uh, the uh, space age sort of the future. <laughs> we were driven back to the Stone Age in so many ways, <laughs> which actually would be an all right thing, isn't it? There is this kind of pretense about progress, isn't there? That uh, that things uh, that we are now much more, as in quote, civilized than actually we are the uh, probably the single greatest danger to the planet. Not you and I, but uh, but the human race. Uh, you know, is the Really, the pestilence on the surface of the world. Being so cheerful well, keeps me going, you see. Yeah, I suppose it's not such a bad thing that we're going backwards, except for the massive amount of death that there'll be when civilization collapses. Well, this is true. This is true. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Hey, well, that'll put Brexit in perspective. No, we'll be worried about that when you're yeah. struggling to find some rats to eat. No, 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 <laughs> no. Well, as long as they're English rats, of course, we, we yes, wouldn't course. Uh, tolerate. We wouldn't tolerate that. Uh, yes, no, that's very interesting. And I, another little image has popped into my mind there to do with where we just were about uh, iconoclastic, um, you know, rebell rebellious theatre, you know, as, as I think yours is. I think yours is. Um, 
provocateur theater i think that's what you do you know well i just like to do stuff that makes people think mm. 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 it doesn't have to be any particular style or something but just something that i mean like when i was able to direct dinner the reason i like that so much was because i realized during the reading that she was dead the whole time mm. page the, the central viewpoint character she, the whole play takes place when she's dying slash dead. But it, that became obvious to me. And then the sort of starts churning in your mind. Well, how do you hint at that? And what do you do? And how, how do you allow people? So, I mean, I don't know if you remember the set, but we had a completely black set with a black tablecloth. We had pictures on the walls, which were in black frames and had nothing inside them. They were just black. The whole thing was just wonderful. It's such a well-written play. Um, now, whether the people that came to see it, whether that just went flying straight over their heads or not, I don't know, but it meant a lot to me. I have to say, <laughs> I must tell you at this point that it went straight over the head of the stage manager. <laughs> and I painted the set, or partially painted it, with you and many others, and with uh, my daughter. Who, Your daughter, yes. Uh, yes, yes, that's how she got into Era. the habit. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Dinner was that was a, I was talking to, to uh, Charlotte uh, the other day because her daughter and my daughter have been in, in the play box Antigone at uh, at the Dream Factory, which was absolutely sensational. Absolutely. Sensational. I was talking to, to well, weirdly, and I'll touch on this with you as well, because this is just to bring us back down to earth to, for a bit. And then I want to go back into more uh into deeper territory as it were <clears throat> but line learning that's what i was talking to charlotte about because i said to charlotte you know you know in dinner when you're doing when you're doing that uh because she said to me the way i learn where she learns lines is to uh read the and read and read the whole play in great big chunks if not the entire thing over and over and over and over and then i was on to alex uh, capilla the other day on one of these and she said she learns lines by doing them in bunches of three. She'll learn three, then she'll go back over the three, then three, and go back over that same. And when she's got those three secure, she'll go on to the next three. Really contrasting. So, Steve, how do you do it? Because viewers will know, both of people who watch this, both people who watch this, and it turns out you're one of them. So the other person who watches this will, of course, remember, uh, will, of course, remember you, well, I believe you, you co-directed um, the uh, Rowan Atkinson, uh, the, the Blackadder thing. Um, well, I was this. I was the assistant. Well, assist, assistant. The yes, ending that would be fair. was my idea, which I'm always very proud of. The what? Sorry. The ending. The ending. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely incredible ending. Hmm. But you appeared in that um, <clears throat> as Flashheart, didn't you? Ah uh, yes, for two performances because uh, David was ill. Yeah, he was ill, and you had to pick it up within. Well, I think he 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 ha tried to hang on as long as he could, didn't he? And then I think he got about. Tell um, us that tale. Tell us that tale, Steve. What about oh. six hours notice? Um, but I mean, I had an advantage because I've been to loads of the rehearsals. Um, so for just about all the rehearsals, in fact. So I kind of knew um, quite a lot of it. But yeah, I mean, I, I suppose in that kind of situation, you you go into overdrive. Um, and you don't want to let anyone down, but also the pressure's off to an extent. If you've spent three months rehearsing something, people expect you to get it right. And they're pretty unforgiving if you get it wrong, because after all, the audience has paid the money. You know, it's the least you can do, really. Mm. Whereas if you've been given six hours notice and you get it fairly right, everyone goes, well, that was amazing. Well done, Steve. That was brilliant. I don't know how you did it. <laughs> Yeah, but even, you'll be very modest, so, but even, even so. Removing the pressure does make a, make a difference, because I knew that if, if I got it just about right, and I did make a couple of mistakes, um, but nothing serious, but I was close enough so that um, it looked better than it was, probably. It was sensational. And now I only heard it from the back, of course, because I played the very important part of some German airman or something, uh, with a rather pivotal role, a pivotal role, I, th I thought. Uh, I came on and said uh, uh, nine bitter and left the stage. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, but from the back, and there was a real sense in the back of kind of willing you on, and 
because it's a major it's a major part actually isn't it you know and david well, and you did it in your own way but but it it, it it was very very thrillingly done if i may say yeah I, I think i did it quite differently to david yeah mm. but um yeah just a different interpretation it seemed to work anyway you really did it was a great wonderful wonderful piece of theater that from top to bottom the ending just in case there are just in case people haven't you know weren't didn't know weren't, weren't able to see it just just tell us the story of the ending then and how that came well out. David and I were talking about the ending and he'd seen it uh, when when they came out and did the sort of normal bowing thing. And he said, well, I'm not quite sure how that worked and was it that good? And maybe if we sort of just had them in silhouettes and they sort of didn't bow and then took took it to black and got them off or something like that. And I, I said, well, no, no, they're dead. Why are they on at all? They're dead. Mm. Just leave them dead. So mm. the lights came up. The, uh, the birds were tweeting. Um, it, it, we had a, a screen and it's a, we did the same thing as they did on the TV series where it faded to the Flanders poppies and the birds were tweeting and the birds were tweeting on a loop. It's about a two minute loop. And um, they just were just there. That was it. It was the end. Nobody came back out. The audience sat, well, each night sat there waiting for the actors to come out Mm. The actors never came out because they were dead. Mm. Mm. And eventually somebody in the audience would stand up and start to leave and the rest of the audience would leave. And it's very hard to sort of, I mean, it sounds contrived, but I suppose it was hundred years since the end of the first world war that we did that. Mm. And it was far from contrived. It just seemed to work. I think it's one of those things where you really had to be there. Yes. It, it sounds mad even the way I'm saying it now, but uh, no, it, it definitely yeah. worked. It may do to somebody who hasn't seen it. I don't know, but but I, of course I had the great advantage of seeing it, um, and uh, because I was only in the first half, so I could see the second and went and and, and saw it a number of times. Um, but uh, but that ending was because uh, of course you had the, the poppies uh, like Albert Hall fluttering down uh, onto the mm. stage, didn't you? And uh, it was incredible to be in the audience. You call these velvet moments. velvet moments, yes, yeah. What is a velvet moment, Steve? It's when... Uh, the audience...